Welcome everyone. My name is Nicole Ricci. I'm on the board of New York Small Pharma. On behalf of New York Small Pharma, I would like to welcome all of you who've logged on this evening to join us, as well as welcome our distinguished guest panelists who we are so honored to host uh, to cover this important topic. As many of you may be aware, earlier today, uh, the Senate announced sponsorship of a bill to decriminalize cannabis at the federal level. The bill is called the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act. It's sponsored by our very own Chuck Schumer, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, our good neighbor, Senator Cory Booker, and, and uh, Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon. Um, just, it's really important to note that the first line of this bill states the war on drugs has been a war on people, particularly people of color. It is so important, so paramount that the government at its highest levels has, have, have recognized this. And the bill itself aims to end decades of harm inflicted on communities of color by removing cannabis from the federal list of controlled substances and empowering states to implement their own cannabis laws. We hear a lot about the acronym BIPOC, uh, Black Indigenous People of Color and the impacts of prohibition to those communities. Tonight, we focus on the I, um, the Indigenous community, a community that we believe has so much, we at New York Small Pharma believe has so much to offer, so much to teach on cultivation, medicinal and spiritual aspect of the marijuana plant. And it's also a community that gets most often the least coverage. So. There's been so many online and in-person events and discussions and forums and investor dinners, all focusing on the money of cannabis, how to get into the business, how do I get a license, how are they gonna allocate the pie, how do I get a slice of pie, how do I make money? So much of it that we here at New York Small Pharma felt it was really important to spend time talking about the culture of cannabis. Uh, not the importance of using and consuming and making money, but the importance of building a relationship with these plants who love the sunshine, who love to be outdoors. And so whether you grow a plant in your apartment window or your outdoor garden or on your farm, you know that these plants communicate with us and they want to have good vibes from us and they wanna form a relationship with us. So tonight, that's what we're gonna focus on, what it means to cultivate plant medicine and what are the ancestral ways long before prohibition, long before labeling it as a drug and long before the modern concept of money and industry became involved. Uh, so tonight we're going to share some important information with you, but what we really want to do is start a dialogue with you. So please submit your questions in the question and answer section of your Zoom window, and I will be asking them to our panelists. Um, we do have a replacement in our program this evening. Travis Andrews will be replacing Shanae Bullock, who could not make this evening's events. Um, so I'm going to start a little bit about telling you about New York Small Pharma, then I'm going to introduce each of our panelists who will come on and speak for about 10 minutes or less, and then we will have all the panelists join at one time, and that's when we're going to take your questions. So please feel free to submit your questions. We really look forward to, to answering them. Uh, so New York Small Pharma is a nonprofit organization. We've been operating in the cannabis space in New York for seven years, but we legally incorporated as a nonprofit under two years ago. Uh, our mission is to foster a socially just, environmentally regenerative, and economically inclusive cannabis community. Our vision is a world where cannabis, where cannabis is consciously grown, excuse me, our vision is where consciously grown, community-based cannabis heals the earth, uplifts our communities and ushers in a new economic model of fairness and inclusivity for all agriculture and our culture at large. Um, we are so young that we've exist entirely on volunteer help. Um, everyone who works for or at New York Small Pharma does so by the graces of their volunteer work and we've been supported by individual donations. We're so small we have not yet been able to be competitive for a grant or received our first sponsor uh, donation, although we hope to change that this year. Um, so we're very humbled and grateful to all of those of you out there who do contribute to us, especially our monthly donors. You make it, you make it possible for us to do the work that we do. We're one of the few organizations that focus on the environment and cannabis in New York and uh, your donations are what allows us to bring these programmatic events to you like free webinars. So thank you to all those who do donate, to do donate and those of you that can donate and so feel called to donate, um, we will have donation buttons up 
in the chat, feel free to donate to us or to any of our panelists that are speaking tonight. All of uh, these panelists operate on uh, donations and working programs for the community. And we'll also be posting other links, uh, links to their Instagram posts, links to their websites, as well as links to resources that we feel are important and go along with this topic. So without taking any much of your time uh, with me, I'm going to turn and uh, introduce you to our panelists now, starting with our president of New York Small Pharma, Donna Burns. Welcome, Donna. Thank you, uh, Nicole. Thank you very much. And thanks for everybody who's showing up this evening for this important topic. You know, our hope really is that we go beyond the law and beyond the policy to the deeper aspects of who we are. I mean, how does cannabis fit into our heritage? How, does, how do we relate to this plant? How do we relate to each other? These are really important questions as we create a cannabis community. Um, as Nicole mentioned, this uh, new draft cannabis law, the Cannabis Administrative, Administration Opportunity Act, has really been a war on people, especially people of color. Uh, people of color and indigenous people are arrested at uh, five times, up to five times the rate of white people. And the fact that I just found out is that uh, Latinx or Hispanic people are considered white for these arrests statistics. So if we actually factored in that brown people, uh, Latinx and uh, Hispanic people or people of color, I think we'd see even uh, higher statistics than that. And that's even with 19 jurisdictions legalizing cannabis. At the outset, um, I'm up in the Hudson Valley, New York. I want to acknowledge and thank our indigenous ancestors of these land who here took this land, the Lenape, the Wappingers, the Taconic, the Mohicans, and all of the tribes up and down the Hudson River Valley. The Hudson River, the Mohican Tuck, uh, is the river that flows both ways. Today, more than 370 million people across 70 countries worldwide identify as indigenous. They belong to more than 5,000 different groups and speak more than 4,000 different languages. Indigenous acknowledges that a person's ancestors lived on the land, on particular lands, before new people arrived and became dominant. And it doesn't mean there's one in homogenous indigenous culture, and it's something very important to respect when we talk about indigenous peoples, because every nation, every indigenous nation, and every indigenous peoples will address these issues, especially cannabis, in their own way. There's no indigenous government that will set up a, a common indigenous response to cannabis. And um, as we're starting to see throughout um, North America and elsewhere, there are different responses, and it's important that we respect respect those different views with respect to cannabis. Um, and while all humans may have common ancestors, and this is a common anthropological view that we all date back to common ancestors, I especially want to acknowledge that I don't identify as indigenous and I'm extremely sensitive to issues of, regarding cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation. Rather than uh, cultural appropriation, which is theft based on power, or privilege, our intent here is engagement based upon responsibility and ethics. Our goal is to build bridges and engage with traditional teachings of other cultures as part of a creative process. At its core, cultural appreciation includes the establishment of reciprocal relationships, of giving back, of reciprocity. And that's something extremely important to bear in mind as we consider um, our role as, um, as uh, keepers of these traditions and spreaders of these traditions. It's interesting that unlike the co colonial uh, worldview or the colonizer worldview where nature is viewed as something that we dominate and take from, we extract from, we use, the indigenous worldview is quite different. It is based upon sustainability where there's a moral and spiritual obligation to care for the land and for all beings. The Haudenosaunee um, precept, you, many of you may have heard, is that we live and work for the benefit of seven generations into the future. That's about 150 years. How different is that from the, the notion that we just gotta get it while we can and extract, extract, extract. Respect and humility are the needed building blocks 
for our lives and our communities, and especially in the cannabis space. And they lead to minimal exploitation of other living creatures and avoid the arrogance and aggressive uh, activity of uh, missionary activity, secular imperialism, and patriarchy. There is a Lakota term that I become familiar with, mitakwiase, uh, which roughly translates to all my relations or we're all related. And it's a recognition that everything and everyone is connected. We're all relations, not just all of us as people, but all the animals, all the plants, the water, the air, all of it. It's we're all connected and everything we do affects everything else. We share our ancestors and we share our future and respect and openness to learn from uh, others is vital as we create this new cannabis community. And it's essential, especially that we embody the values of care and curiosity. There is so much we don't know about each other. Rather than um, viewing it as foreign as the other, we can be curious and learn and share. For the thousands of years that humans have had a relationship with this plant, and some dated back to 12,000 years ago, um, its uses have evolved and different cultures have found different um, names for it and sought it out for different functions. You might have heard some of them, bong, ganja, pango, esrar, vijaya, kancha, nashka. I looked it up on Wikipedia and they have over 50 different names. Uh, clearly there's a deep relationship with this plant. And even in English, we know that there's many different uh, words that we use for cannabis. Uh, we're calling it cannabis based on the Latin name, but marijuana. I mean, we all know that one. Pot, uh, weed, smoke, so many of them. I think if we all came together, we would see uh, a great depth of relationship that people have, uh, have with this plant. And it's really, as Nicole mentioned, it's only recent history that we've equated this plant with something illegal and harmful. And, and sadly, uh, due to the racist and discriminatory roots of, um, of this uh, program. But the war on cannabis, importantly, did not just stop there. This was really, it wasn't isolated. Many teacher plants have been subject to um, this, this very same thinking, this very same war, and they've been targeted like peyote or salvia divinorum and uh, uh, Mullen and many others. And in fact, the, uh, the pushing down and the uh, demoting of herbal medicine is an aspect of this kind of conduct. I heard it said recently, which I thought was just fantastic. Before there were doctors, there was medicine and the plants are our medicine. Um, and we, uh, the, the efforts to interfere with the human plant relationship hopefully are coming to an end. I think for these teacher plants like cannabis and others, we have to ask, especially as we're growing, what is it this cannabis community wants to create? Do we want to follow this extractive industrial agriculture model where uh, it's grounded in large scale, high density monocropping uh, that has enormous cost to our health, to the health of the planet, and um, or do we want to go forward and look ahead those seven generations? We know that the exploitive monoculture growing uh, mechanisms destroys health and destroys biodiversity and destroys the planet. And on the other hand, when cannabis is grown regeneratively with respect and care, not only for the plant, not only for the earth, but for those who work in the cannabis, uh, with cannabis and those who interact with the plant, it, and we grow that way for more than just profit, we truly honor and embody the messages of our ancestors and honor all our relations. This approach creates diversity of people and diversity of the plant. And uh, those of us who interact with the plant know that cannabis is extremely diverse. It may have one um, Latin name, cannabis uh, sativa, but there's many, many strains. Uh, the cultivar is the botany term that's used, hundreds or even thousands. And as long as people are free to grow this plant and permitted to engage in research, there'll likely be many more. The cannabis that could be grown in New York State will develop differently than the cannabis that would be grown, let's say in New Mexico or in Oklahoma. 
And so our hope for the future is really truly that we do remember these lessons of our ancestors. And I just wanna uh, close by uh, mentioning a quote that I read uh, recently from Winona LaDuke. Uh, she wrote it for uh, Independence Day, July 4th, but I just thought it was so wonderful. I'd like to share it. She says, it's time for Interdependence Day, not Independence Day. That's when we can recognize and value each other. Th that would be good evolution for America. And maybe we will learn to be patriots to the land and care for each other. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you, Donna. So now we're going to um, turn to our next speaker, whose name is Travis Andrews. Travis lives in central Oklahoma and he operates a small farm with his family. He's an organic cultivar, a fermented input specialist, a ceremonial helper, and a cultivation educator. Uh, he has an Instagram uh, handle called Native Farm Solutions, and I encourage you all to check him out on Instagram, and we're very honored to have uh, Travis speak with us tonight. Welcome, Travis. Thank you for uh, having me here on your, um, your program here this evening. Um, uh, <clears throat> so like she was, uh, uh, Donna was, was mentioning, um, uh, I was invited here uh, by way of uh, Instagram. I have, uh, it's uh, Native Farming Solutions. Um, and we promote uh, indigenous uh, cultivation, uh, not so much just for cannabis. I always try to point out that it's not a cannabis page. Um, and we, we promote uh, just cultivation all around uh, medicine and uh, healing. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of times I kind of like to take shots at the cannabis uh, uh, community um, because we also grow things like corn, ancestral corn. And, uh, you know, the stories tied with these, the, the types of corn that we have, they go back, uh, you know, imaginable uh, generations. Um, one time we were visiting uh, one of my grandpa's uh, friends in Arizona and he was asking my wife what her clan was. And they were the same clan. And, and he said that uh, in their, their clan, in their clan stories, uh, talks about how yellow and white corn moved throughout the Southwest. Um, and the region where they live is where, where it ended. <clears throat> they have stories about how the yellow corn went on the other side of the Mesa um, and the white corn, you know, white corn stayed on one side and the yellow corn went on the other side. The white corn was where my wife was from and the yellow corn was where he was from. It was related by way of these stories. Uh, beautiful things. Um, and, and, you know, so sometimes I take shots at the cannabis community because the, uh, the stories and the lineage and all of that stuff of cannabis in America is not that old. It's really recent. It's really a short history. Um, you know, and the kind of stories that we have in regards to cultivation and medicine and healing and whatnot, like, 1492 that's that's hardly even historical you know um <clears throat> you know so in regards to decolonizing uh cannabis uh, one of the things i like to do on my page is compare and contrast um uh, how hemp and cannabis spread across this continent uh and uh, also the way that colonization happened um and uh <clears throat> I'm really grateful to be invited on this because uh, they, these are things that I'm, I'm passionate about. I love teaching and sharing with people. Um, I've stepped away a little bit from posting on my Instagram just because I was, uh, I'm trying to reach out to the indigenous community. I was getting more and more attention from non-indigenous uh, uh, cannabis cultivators and uh, that's, that's not the direction I'm headed. Um, you know, so, so uh, anyways, when it comes to, you know, comparing and contrasting uh, the history of cannabis in America, um, I love it. Uh, 1492, 1776, 1885, and 1985. Those are four of my favorite uh, times in history. Yeah, um, decolonizing cannabis, you know, going back to how hemp and cannabis came here. Uh, hemp made colonization possible. Uh, it wasn't until um, the uh, Dutch acquired hemp fabric um, and they shared that with uh, with England. Um, it, it was, sea travel wasn't possible until they started using hemp fibers. That's what made colonization possible to get over here. Um, in a nutshell, uh, hemp empowered entire nations. Uh, and this is something I love to share with their indigenous people in regards to trying to understand what this planet is, where it came from and how it came here. Um, you know, uh, hemp, empowered nations, whoever had hemp had the strongest militaries. 
uh, basically how it worked out. Um, with that, they were able to come over here and hemp was so important uh, in regards to uh, um, military societies. Um, hemp was so important that uh, all new colonies were required to grow hemp over here. And all this stuff was taking place over in uh, New York area in, in that portion of the country. Um, you know, uh, indentured uh, servants uh, volunteered to come to the Americas. Um, any, all new colonies had to grow hemp. It was paid as tax to the, to the crown. Um, and indentured servants were allowed to come over here and work on hemp farms. Uh, and they would in turn get 50 acres where they had to grow hemp and send it back. Hemp was, was just a, a, an incredibly important seed at one point in time. Um, you know, going to 1776, uh, tobacco paved the way to make America what it is, and it was y'all's tobacco from the East Coast that was used. I believe uh, Delaware tribes, the one that I've read about quite a bit. Um, um, after colonization, uh, <clears throat> America, in 1776, the Declaration of, of Independence is when America separated itself from uh, English money, is kind of how I like to put it. And what happened was they started producing tobacco. America developed its own economy with tobacco, feeding that to, to England. Um, so with that, uh, after 1776, hemp production declined here and tobacco took over. Um, and that went all the way until 1885, you know, the beginning of the Dawes Act. Uh, the Dawes Act was about westward expansion. Westward expansion was because the soils in the East Coast were ruined from uh, uh, tobacco and cotton overproduction. Uh, westward expansion was necessary for cotton production to continue. Um, th this is 1885. Uh, the Dawes Act, well, I was born in 1983, so I was born 100 years after the Dawes Act. Uh, my generation, 100 years after the Dawes Act, and uh, you know, I'd like to point out that um, we are 2.7% of the population in America, uh, right below Mexicans and right above Asians. And when you go to out to eat, you know, you aside from your favorite Mexican restaurant and aside from your favorite Asian restaurant, what is your favorite Native American restaurant? You know, in Asian, there are a lot. There's Japanese, there's Korean, there's Chinese. There, there's so many uh, variations to this, this these foods. Um, but where's the Native American uh, foods? You know, so so anyways, in regards to uh, decolonizing. Um, um, cultivation. You know, I like talking about how uh, um, hemp uh, helped make America what it is today, hemp and tobacco. Um, and people talk about how hemp and cannabis grows like tobacco. Uh, hemp and cannabis grows like uh, tobacco, corn, and tomatoes. Um, and, you know, those crops come from here. And the best hemp, tomatoes, and tobacco will come from here. Um, and, and we, we need to be growing these things. Um, so, so, so anyways, uh, you know, in, in recent times, um, now that it's legalized here uh, in Oklahoma, it legalized and it's all over the place. I can't believe how many people grow. Um, and we've caught on to the, the natural farming aspect of it. JADAM and Korean natural farming are two systems that came from overseas. Um, and these systems were introduced in the 60s. They now, uh, they are a, a system of self, uh, self regeneration uh, farming, um, where a farmer can acquire and make all of the uh, nutrients and IPM and everything needed for farming from the farm. Um, this system works overseas uh, for co commercial purposes. Um, this system was never intended for cannabis, but it was shared with the cannabis world first. And I always believe it's because they just wanted to, to show people that even the world's most demanding crops, um, that their system is sufficient for even the, mo the world's most demanding crops. Um, and so in recent times, uh, learning, uh, studying Korean natural farming and JADAM, I've come to find out that it is simply uh, food, food preservation methods um, that are up applied to plants. Um, and this method is herbalism. Um, and this method is spiritualism. Um, first and foremost, before it was shared with the world to grow, you know, recreational marijuana. Before that, it was used to, to make medicine. 
uh, medicine that works for plants, but also for people. Um, so in regards to decolonizing uh, cannabis, I just like to point out that um, this plant grows best when Ray, when fed like an Indian child, uh, this grant grows best when cared for like an Indian child. Um, you know, so in regards to uh, where we're at today as a people, we wish to heal. And I feel that um, this plant has unbelievable uh, amounts of, of benefits to offer for us as long as we grow it in a respectful way uh, as in an indigenous manner. Um, so that's about all I have to say right now. I, I, I hope. Oh, thank you so much, Travis. That was beautiful. I appreciate your words. We look forward to hearing more from you later. So next, I'd like to introduce our uh, final panelists to speak tonight before everybody joins on screen. Uh, Sharon Smiley, uh, through his work with uh, We Are Earth Cooperative, Sharon is training young people of color to be leaders in urban agriculture. They are providing access to health, ancestral practices, and a sense of agency around food and medicinal sovereignty to students in at-risk communities, namely in East New York and Brownsville. We Are Earth is currently working tirelessly on non-cannabis or psilocybin projects. Uh, at the same time, Sharon is laying the groundwork to provide access for people of color to operate as expert technicians and entrepreneurs in the fields of medicinal and theogenic production and products. Uh, your dollars and time, other resources are able to contribute um, to this project um, are required to continue to take shape. So if you feel called to, please donate to Sharon's cause. Welcome, Sharon. Aho. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this program and to, you know, follow Donna and Travis sharing, um, heartfelt sharings. It's, tremendous amount of passion and discipline going into um, what's been contributed here today. And yeah, you know, this, and that's going to continue. So, you know, my name is Saron Smiley. <clears throat> my pronouns are he and him. Uh, um, I like to honor everybody's way of being. And, you know, I wanted to start off by sharing, you know, great gratitude for the land that, um, that this discussion is coming that I'm able to present my my portion of the discussion from, you know, um, honored and 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 stewarded by Lenape Kanarsi people, um, with great contributions by Taino people, and I'd like to, you know, it would still be immaculately stewarded by them today uh, if it weren't for uh, the such violent deeds of imperialism and colonialism. So I just kind of want to reflect on that. I want to give a big thanks to Nicole and. Donna for having us all here and having you all here to listen to this and contribute your energy and re resonate this, reflect it back into your communities where you are. You know, um, this is an important intersection, cannabis consciousness, the environment, you know, um, cannabis being a filter between, you know, consciousness and the environment in this, in this case. Um, you know, we're all aspects of like the cannabis, we're beings of consciousness and the environment. We are of that period. And, you know, this being cannabis holds, you know, a tremendous amount of uh, power in, in having us align with that, you know, and before any history was written, before, you know, any culture or industry were, were built around, around this being, cannabis, <clears throat> it was used to, to access higher states of being, you know, it's, you know, we talk about, you know, the, the bong and, you know, it's already, you know, that, that narrative in, in the Hindu culture. And, you know, we often see depictions of Shiva, you know, with the cannabis, the bong as, you know, his favorite plant, you know, here's, you know, the Lord of creation um, and cannabis is his favorite plant, um, you know, and the hashish and, you know, the regions of that world where, you know, this, these seeds are, are you know, originate. So, you know, we, we get a sense of, you know, what this, what this plant's relationship with human beings are, you know, and I've, I've had, you know, great privilege of, of 
you know, discovering some of my indigenous uh, roots on this planet, you know, on, and especially on this continent. You know, my father um, discovered late in his life that he is, you know, I guess you would say an eighth plus an eighth, or how does that work? A quarter uh, Cherokee and Blackfoot. And that came to be something that was present for me later on. And, you know, me leaning, leaning in and getting closer to that, you know, I recognize to Travis's point, you know, some of the, the, the origin stories of the tobacco were very similar, you know, in this continent where, you know, the tobacco served as a plant medicine, a guide, a teacher that taught us to uh, work more closely with the other medicines of the planet. That when we, you know, discovered the tobacco, we were able to like lean in and listen to the forests um, in ways that were, you know, instrumental in us, you know, tuning ourselves to the ways of, you know, the cattail and the, the, the willow and in other parts of the world, you know, the cannabis has a very similar, uh, very similar reverence. And, you know, um, we kind of fast forward into getting that plant, you know, the cannabis from the imperial shuffling and commoditization, you know, large in part to, you know, the Dutch, the British, the Portuguese on warships, uh, moving it into every colony possible. And despite that, you know, and, and in combination with, you know, the other addictive or uh, uh, what do you call that indulgent substances that were part of that trade, you know, salt, sugar, opium, you name it. This was, this was the way of building tobacco. This was the way of building economies uh, through imperialization. Despite that, you know, we still face a tremendous amount of uh, moral regulation against folks not so much against the plants, but against the people who carry the plants. So, you know, although they are introduced uh, by uh, the, the creators of the moral regulation, they were still aimed at individuals uh, to, to further destabilize communities. And I think we have a great opportunity uh, with this plant as a teacher um, to kind of bring us back to the higher self, you know, that that origin story of learning to be in the world a little bit better. Uh, maybe the cannabis is cultivating us to spread it um, as far and deep as possible so that we can awaken so that a little bit more, a few more of us can, you know, shift past the paradigms that we currently are stuck in. Um, cannabis has an amazing way of breaking through that, <clears throat> uh, whether you ask for it or not. Hence, you know, many people uh, intake cannabis and, and proclaim that they have anxiety attacks. And then when I experienced that in a healing context, because I work in that way a lot as an herbalist, um, I, I recognize that this is this is the work that you need that one needs to do. Right? When you have an anxiety attack because you're working with cannabis, your mind and these structures are moving really quickly, and they need to be, you know, reevaluated. And you need to pay attention to what's coming up for you there. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot going on for us societally. And there's a lot of people who are claiming that they cannot work with the cannabis because it makes, you know, for a great, uh, strong energetic reactions. You know, so, you know, I kind of want to fast forward, you know, and over the past, you know, several decades, uh, these bodies of research that are coming out around cannabis are, you know, pointing at you know, the, the biology, the chemistry, the psychoactivity, the physiology, the economy, the politics, you know, while the spiritual, spatial, and cultural, you know, aspects remain silenced. And, you know, now's the time for us to, to sort of shape our walk with this plant and therefore, you know, everything else as stewards, if we can. And, you know, we have an, an incredible opportunity and leverage with you know, the, the proven biology, chemistry, psychoactivity, physiology, and economy that are demonstrated to, to really prop up, you know, the, the latter, you know, the spatial, cultural, and spiritual. When I say spatial, I mean like where it exists on the planet, where it's from, um, <clears throat> how much space is in between it, where it's, where it's legal and where it's not, right? Um, you know, essentially it comes down to, you know, not so much the legalization and what we're gonna do, but, you know, giving a damn, like caring enough, 
because we have all the research, we have all the resources, like there's nothing that needs to exist on the planet in order for us to arrive at, you know, equality and, you know, uh, inclusion. You know, that's the thing that uh, remains elusive based on where we stand and what we stand for. And, you know, I think here, right now, we talk about cannabis consciousness and the environment, you know, what we're talking about is not, you know, a loose set of correlations, but essentially, you know, what we stand for in this conversation on cannabis. And, you know, we've, we've done everything else pretty well. Uh, so I think it's time that, you know, we stand in solidarity uh, with the people who continue to be excluded and targeted systematically, um, you know, mainly indigenous people um, on this continent. Um, and black people on this continent are, you know, targeted as if uh, it's right, as if, as if it's correct, as if there's actually some data to support the targeting. <clears throat> you know, and I, you know, there's there's so many things that we need to talk about from uh, uh, on a meta level. And I'm, I'm happy to spend as much time there as possible. I, I'd like to meditate with you on it. You know, if we could have a, a sound bath or some food to bring it into our bodies and get even closer to doing it that way, I look forward to that day as well. Um, but, you know, these, these things can't be addressed in one session alone. I look, I look forward to expanding on these points with you. Uh, but, you know, we need to translate this into, into what might be regulatory language at some point. I don't, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I got some ideas. <laughs> I've got some ideas and, you know, I'll keep it brief, you know, and they, they come down to some simple things, you know, like the way what we're doing impacts the air, the way we're consuming the resources, resources of this planet to, to make cannabis possible, the way that we're using the water um, to make cannabis possible and diverting it from other living beings and ecosystems, um, the restorative economic impacts and possibilities, and the spiritual and cultural impacts and possibilities. You know? um, churches should be allowed to use the plant. Criminals' records should be expunged. And that's just, to, that's just to, you know, to scratch the surface. And of course, waste and toxicity need to be held at you know very, very high level of accountability for all the cultivations, uh, both outdoor and indoor, that are going to impact, you know, uh, you know, the water table and um, the wastewater management. So I'm, I'm going to put a pin in it there. And as my brother said, aho, matukayasin, and I appreciate uh, your time and attention. Aho. So now we're going to have all of the panelists join us on screen, and we're going to take audience questions. So the first question that I have for you um, that I was, is, People were asking, how did cannabis come to America? Does anyone? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. That's a, it's a great question. And it's one, uh, there are answers that several uh, people are certain of and they conflict. Uh, so one theory is that cannabis came to the Americas with uh, what are called the mound people. It came across the Bering Straits um, about 2,500 years ago with people who settled in the central part of this country uh, in the Mississippi Valley and, and Ohio. And there's some archeological evidence to support that theory. Um, there's some residues that have been identified as cannabis uh, and uh, in the mound people uh, uh, archeological sites. Another theory is that the Vikings actually were responsible for bringing cannabis to the Americas. The, we know the Vikings used hemp uh, for their sails, for their ropes, for their clothing. Um, so that's another theory. And the Vikings, of course, would predate the um, European colonizers. And then the, yet the other theory, which I believe um, Travis mentioned, is uh, the theory that it is actually uh, an old world plant that came with the colonizers. And that was the first time it, it came into the Americas. Uh, and um, in fact, I, I heard one statement, which uh, is somewhat amusing, uh, but it, it was uh, a uh, Lakota person who said, cannabis was the only good thing the white man brought with him. Uh, and so 
maybe maybe that's to, that's true as well. And so I think the answer is nobody knows. Um, but we do know that cannabis quickly found acceptance throughout the Americas, not just in, in um, what's currently the United States territory, but in Mexico, there are several um, indigenous communities that, that have woven cannabis into their uh, religious and spiritual traditions and the same thing in South America. And so the, the notion was that some of uh, the reason it came with the colonizers wasn't just to grow uh, hemp for its utilitarian purpose, but that as part of the slave trade, the cannabis came with uh, some of the African peoples who were brought here against their will uh, and uh, brought their most important plants. And, and so I think the answer is nobody knows, but there's, there's a lot of darn good theories out there. Um, and clearly it's taken root literally in this country. I have a couple uh, things I'd like to add to that. Um, one is um, when talking about like the history of colonization and uh, the period of history between 1885 and 1985, it's it's not that long and it's really interesting like all the, uh, how, how fast modernization took effect in that time frame. So from 1885 to the 1913s when we go into World War I, uh, then the 20s, we go into World War II. Uh, during that time frame, uh, here in Oklahoma uh, is where um, the, the last pandemic was, the, uh, the, the Spanish flu. And they were saying it happened in uh, Oklahoma, Kansas border. And oddly enough, the first two places hit were uh, Black Wall Street and um, Concho, Oklahoma, the Cheyenne Reservation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the for the longest time, they were blaming it on world travel. They were saying it was due to global travel and that's how those types of diseases and things made it over here and, and spread the way they did. Um, and so an interesting thing, like I, I study cannabis uh, genetics quite a bit. And like I said, it's not that, it doesn't go that far back. Um, 1920s, it's, you know, a hundred years worth of history um, when ca uh, cannabis versus hemp were kind of moving around in the Americas. Um, and uh, an interesting thing about the way cannabis uh, genetics have developed is that if you track the, the movement of the US military, you kind of notice that uh, things about cannabis, um, changes that happened in cannabis were happening when the military was traveling to different parts. Um, in the 90s was a big thing. There's a big thing about skunk, uh, cannabis skunk. There's a skunk revitalization right now. There, uh, people are talking about how the prohibition era ruined um, American cannabis um, because they had to do things like breed the smell out of it or breed them so that they were smaller plants that could be grown indoors. And um, they said the prohibition era ruined it. And prior to that, um, um, <clears throat> uh, Prior to that, we just have a different uh, genetic stock. Um, and what was in America, it's uh, the activity of American cannabis was biggest between the 1920s and the 1990s. Um, prior to that, uh, you have the hippie trail overseas when, when people from the European countries were traveling to where cannabis originates from. Um, there's actually a big movement right now, a big skunk movement where people are reintroducing uh, cannabis from the hippie trail era and, and kind of dogging American genetics because this guy's whatever. Um, and I, I know some of the, uh, I know some of the, I know, I know one of the players from the European side. Um, and it's really fascinating. The, the genetics that are being reintroduced are kind of blowing away modern strains. Uh, pro prohibition era strains are just weak. Um, and a lot of people have made money off of these modern strains and it's a big thing. It's kind of a big, big thing. These people who are re-releasing uh, strains older than the American strains, they're getting flack, they're getting suppressed, they're being hated on, they're being dogged out. Americans don't want people to believe that there's anything better than what America produced. Um, but uh, anyways, that's my, my little bit on cannabis history. I've, I've got a little bit too. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, I mean, there, there, you know, like there are, there are a bunch of theories on it and there's no way to know 100% exactly where it's at. There are a bunch of, you know, people doing like forensic ethnobotany and genealogy and kind of tracing things back. And there's some theories um, that, you know, say that it's, over, again, like over 12,000 years old and it comes from 
you know, the original seeds and genetics come from, you know, uh, like the Middle Eastern territory and it's like found its way essentially along the Silk Road, right? Um, and then, you know, around the east and around the east and then west coasts of Africa down through um, uh, South Africa and essentially over into uh, the US with Portuguese and British imperialism, you know, for tra trace the military, right? Even before the American military uh, with the movement of the military, you know, the plants were, were coming along. So, you know, for sure, I, I believe that, you know, because any plant 12,000 years old, like a ginkgo tree or, you know, any plant that's been on the planet for that long, you know, and it has thousands of years of use, uh, people were braiding it in their hair and bringing it over as like other essential plants were brought over um, with people who were earth bearing, got on boats and knew they were gonna end up somewhere mysterious. They came with the foods and the medicines that sustained them. <clears throat> so I think, you know, there's for sure, you know, people who migrated, whether they came through the Bering Strait or they came over um, on ships knew, you know, how to work with medicines. And, you know, the, the folks who were cultivating in that way were not doing monoculture fields. So, you know, the presence of it would look very different um, for, for people who were working with it medicinally. You know, it might be, you know, intercropped within, you know, other medicines in the forest, the mugwort and your mullein, your cattails, right? You know, all this stuff is kind of working together. Maybe not cattails, it's a little wet. But, um, you know, other, other things that are, that are relevant. And then you have, you know, the plantation style cultivation for, you know, industrial use and, you know, two very different contexts of, you know, one, the, the, the cultivar and then two, you know, it's production and how it's being bred for that, for that land use. And then you have a complete divergence in, you know, what's prioritized um, in the, in the gene selection. So, um, I, yeah, there's a cool little graphic about that. I don't know if I could show it to y'all if we have enough time for that. Um, is, is that okay? I can just do it for like two seconds. Can I show a little graphic of like a map in the timeline for that? Nicole? Yeah, I have to make you a co-host so I think you can share your screen. Okay, I think it shows it now. All right, okay, hang on. Um, Yeah, so just, you know, it's anecdotal. And this is, you know, based on, you know, some ethnobotanic, you know, bot ethnobotany studies and geography, geographical study of cannabis history. So, you know, you get a sense of, oh, so yeah, the or, origin in like the Tibetan region, really, um, like the, the Mongols are given credit for cultivating it, and working with it most closely. And then as you see, a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of movement, you know, before Jesus, and then <laughs> well into well into right now. So. I think we could do a whole topic on on land race and uh, and the ethno botany of, of cannabis. It's it's super fascinating, and I think a lot of people that consume it would be quite surprised to learn um, so much about the difference between a cultivar and a strain and um, the different terrapines and what it all means. So I'm gonna continue asking you guys questions that have been submitted because I wanna to get to our audience questions. Um, although I would love to hear more about how to raise cannabis like an Indian child if we have time to get to it. That's also very interesting. Um, okay, but here's a question from, another question from our audience. Cannabis and community gardens in New York City. When the 18th, when the 18 months pass, I think uh, speaking about when we becomes legal for recreational grow, Will folks who only have access to land uh, via community gardens be able to grow in said gardens? And this is definitely something that we're discussing in, in New York Small Pharma. So I can also weigh in on this, um, but uh, this, I, I'm gonna be interested to hear, I mean, from the, maybe the New Yorkers about growing in community gardens of New York. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say nobody knows, but you know, if we have anything to do with it, yes. 
Absolutely, yes. Um, I mean, this is a big unknown in terms of the regulatory environment and what will happen. I mean, in New York, we, we actually have to get the regulatory framework established, which seems to be taking quite a long time. Um, the law was passed on March 31st, and uh, we have yet to get the um, vital infrastructure established, the Office of Cannabis Management and the Cannabis Control Board, because um, quite frankly, it's a New York type thing where they just can't really agree. They probably couldn't agree today is Wednesday. Uh, so, <laughs> but yes, this is a great question and it's something that we would love to see happen. And I think not only community gardens, but really creating opportunities. So this does not become an uh, 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 endeavor that is only available to those people who have land. So really creating those opportunities. Um. Can I jump in on that, Donna? So, yeah, thank you for that. I think that's important. Yet yeah, we don't we don't know, and you know, there's a whole bunch of things to consider. There's going to be like zoning considerations, like whether the garden itself is the only area, if it's like a non-licensed thing, and if you were to do it indoors, does that is it still the same amount of plants? If you like the yard and indoors mixed together, one address. So you know, there's lots of you know um, details that need to be be shaped. You know, one of the things that we're doing uh, with New York City based grows is looking to to utilize indoor spaces so that we can leverage land, the lack of land access for the communities that live, you know, in environments like this, you know, very few of us uh, can afford $2 million real estate prices to, you know, have a backyard even or to just have a vacant lot that we own because, you know, once we have cannabis growing there on any sort of professional scale, um, it needs to be protected. I don't know, you know, barbed wire, fencing, things like that all become issues. So we're looking to address, um, address that by moving things indoors because it's gonna be necessary as people um, desire to cultivate here, but do that in a way that honors, you know, the tenets of regenerative and indigenous agriculture, which is to like, not use more than we need um, and to replace everything we take um, and to like build the soil fundamentally. So yeah, you know, if I'm, this conversation could go on for a long time, it's, I, I can't believe we've gone through an hour of it already. Um, but if anybody wants to discuss any more of this with me, I'm super excited to do so. Um, so please, I think my email is placed in there and our sites there. The site does not talk about cannabis because it's just about um, urban ag and accessible agriculture in that context, but it includes that um, just for this, we have to separate the legal things. So um, I do wanna get, is it okay if we just take one more question before we go? Uh, and I just wanted to add like one of the things that we are exploring at New York Small Farm, although we recognize that they're um, you know, we of course really want to promote outdoor grow uh, so that we can have not only no carbons being emitted, but that we're sequestering carbons and that we have food for pollinators and just creating a, the, the right ecological environment for the plants and, and, and for the ecology around this. But, you know, one of the things we, we want to really look at is rooftop gardens, planting not only cannabis, but planting vegetables, planting fruits, planting uh, plants that capture pollutants in the air where there are plenty of those plants that can clean the air. And so um, I agree, we don't wanna see a city covered in barbed wire, but there um, are a lot of creative solutions that we have yet to, to come up with as well. So uh, the next question I'd like to ask you guys are, what are your thoughts on legacy, um, which is the unlicensed market uh, and, the, and the, exchange, the exchange and cultivation of cannabis outside of legal channels? And I, I can't speak for this person, but maybe what the question is asking is that there are legacy markets that are considering maintaining legacy operation and, and, uh, and, and understandably, so if that's the question. What are your thoughts on legacy slash underground markets and the exchange and cultivation of cannabis outside of legal channels? I also have an opinion on that. Yeah, I've got, I've got a lot to say there. Um, <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's, a really, really important um, platform to stand on. And, you know, it, it requires probably the biggest, the biggest bullhorn uh, within 
the conversation about cannabis legalization because you know the the fact of the matter is the the entire schematic for the cannabis industry is following the legacy operations you know the commodification the pricing um the customer pipeline you know what customers enjoy um has all been figured out by uh, legacy operators. And now we have a scenario where, you know, you're essentially criminalized if you cannot afford um, um, either like the resources and the capital upstart to, to become, you know, a, a, a licensed farm, right? How much, how much capital are we talking about? 100,000 for a license, a half a million dollars, a couple of million dollars for facility, et cetera, et cetera. So you're still illegal if you can't afford to be legal. And this becomes, you know, a privilege and, you know, class in essentially, you know, by percentage, a race issue. <clears throat> so, you know, I think that, you know, there's, it's a complicated thing because we know that this is happening for tax, for tax dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but for sure, like, you know, the, the, allowances you know provided for you know uh, sovereignty provided for indigenous people there needs to be some some framework for legacy operations that that functions similarly because you know we're essentially displacing those operators um and gentrifying the marketplace uh with with you know people who have capital resources and i don't have an answer further than that but it's you know probably one of the, one of the things that I'm most passionate about in this transition. I think it. I just will add real briefly to that. I think that's you're absolutely right, Sharon, and um, it's something that uh, we have been very cognizant of. Uh, we have. Uh, I've personally spoken to a, a lot of uh, a bunch of different people in the unlicensed legacy market, we'll call it, um, who want to become legal. They prefer to become legal. They have families. They, you know, they do not want to be underground anymore. But there has to be that pathway. And this is another one of the sticky, um, tricky areas that's going to have to be worked out in the regulations. And I do hope we have the framework in New York, and that we are able to make good on it and and bring this into the conversation. The um, the one of the hooks. I know this this uh, webinar isn't really about law, but one of the hooks, quite frankly, to regulators and lawmakers is if you don't let these people in, they will continue operating and you will not get your tax revenue. And so <laughs> I think that really is an important hook. And I was very encouraged. To, you know, there is funding available in the New York state law. Uh, for uh, startup businesses, and I believe there is funding in the law that um, was just the draft law that was introduced today by Senators Schumer, uh, Booker, and Wyden. And so I think this is something that is also going to require a big push. I would like to, um, if, if we do have a minute more, I would love to hear what Travis has to say about raising the child, because I'm very curious, uh, you know, I have several children, I have uh, several grandchildren, and I would love to hear what it is, how you do, how, what is the way that you raise those children? Uh, okay, man, I'd love to talk about this. Um, okay, so, uh, 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 Korean Natural Farming and JADAM are two systems developed by a father and a son in Korea. Um, and JADAM actually means uh, people reflected by, by nature. Um, beautiful concept. And uh, like, what, um, like what we was talking about, um, people don't grow in boxes and we don't grow under artificial light. Um, it, it's better outside and natural. Um, so, you know, we were talking about the, the prohibition era, plants were bred to uh, take synthetic nutrients and to take artificial light um, and different things like that. They were bred away from being a plant. Um, and so we've been growing and kind of uh, going against the grain um, and not treating our plants like closet queens, but treating them like plants. Um, I don't know. Some some people really shelter their kids and won't let them, you know, fall on the ground or you know, eat dirt or whatever. But uh, over here we do a lot of that. Um, and uh, um, 
you know, these are indigenous plants. People were blown away that last year I was letting my plants go into the uh, snowing season. I was, I was waiting for the frost to hit them. I wanted to see what would happen. Um, in, in regards to cult picking, harvesting other types of medicines and, and fruits and whatnot, a lot of times you let the frost hit them uh, because it changes the flavor. It does a lot of wonderful things to it. Um, people were just blown away. They were like, oh my gosh, you know, you're treating your cannabis like, like a weed, you know, like, you know, and it, but they're going amazing. I don't get how that works. Um, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, so in regards to how they are fed, um, you know, I like to start out by talking about um, something called air pruning and where they use bags instead of pots, instead of plastic pots. Um, and what's neat about it is when you go to transplant and you remove the bag, there's no roots. Um, they call it air pruning because when the roots exposed, are exposed to the air, they, they kind of pull back. Um, so what, what this does is, um, you don't, when you remove the pot, you don't have long stringy roots. Instead, you have a real solid, robust root mass. Um, what this reflects is uh, in Cree, we have moss bags. They're beaded bags. They make your babies look like uh, glow worms, you know, like cater caterpillars. They, they have little snuggle bunny things. Um, and traditionally, they put um, peat moss in there. And uh, peat moss was preferred because it, it's because of its, uh, its antibacterial. Um, children who were put in moss bags were less prone to diaper rash. Um, you know, uh, and so, so from that um, neat fact, uh, seedlings can be fed diluted breast milk. Uh, breast milk contains all the uh, nutrients and enzymes, everything needed for new life uh, and for uh, easy digestion. Um, so, so plants can actually be fed diluted breast milk. Um, and then if you look at the composition of what breast milk is, you know, now that I make, I make a lot of compost teas and different things, I actually try to recreate breast milk. You know, it's like 68% carbohydrates, 2% ash, 2% um, salt content. Um, and that stuff's really easy to recreate. Um, um, and so, uh, you know, we, we try to recreate breast milk and the trick to that is, is um, fermentation. Um, and all fermentation is, is pre-digesting foods. Uh, and fermentation, Korean natural farming is promoted using brown sugar, but uh, sugar is hard to get and people don't know it, but this same thing can be done with rock salt. Uh, fermentation can, can be done with rock salt. Um, so, so with that, what we do is we ferment specific foods for specific nutritional qualities and values. Uh, we hunt down specific uh, growth hormones, um, things like that. Um, a really interesting thing about the way cannab cannabis grows is you can feed, you can feed flowering cannabis um, fruits because those fruits are essentially, you know, all the magnesium, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all those things compiled into, you know, a fruit that's medicine. Um, and we break it down by way of fermentation, make it water soluble, and it can be fed back to plants. So how it works is um, like young plants can be fed sprout tea. Uh, seed sprout tea contains growth hormones for, it contains rooting, rooting hormones. Um, so you can feed young plants seed sprout water. Um, and as they get bigger, you can feed them leafy greens. Um, and an important part is they need a lot of carbohydrates. Um, it's really weird. They need a lot of amino acids because amino acids break down proteins. So we, we hunt a lot of foods that are high in amino acids. And right now the number one is a soy, um, but, but uh, and big ag in America uses soy products, fermented soy products. It's a big thing. And us small farmers are just getting to know about it. Um, it's a huge thing. Um, and if you can't use soy, the next best option is corn. And if you, try, if you look for the best soy products out there, they're usually hit with a corn product, a corn additive. And it's probably just corn starch because that's an anti-caking agent. Um, you know, so um, 
Aside from that, we also uh, break down fish and all we're sourcing is amino acids. We can ferment fish with brown sugar and produce fish amino acids. We combine that with uh, the fermented soy or corn and different things. And we're just trying to, to compound as much amino acids as we can to break down the proteins and release all the uh, nutrients. Um, you know, so fermentation is one way of releasing nutrients from foods and grains. And the other is um, uh, niche tumulization. Niche tumulization is something really important. Um, and niche tumulization, you know, corn over here is, is the equivalent of soy over there, um, which is really interesting. And corn over here, when it was taken overseas and people tried to eat it like we did over here, they got sick. Um, and if you try to eat soy over here, like they do over there, they say you'll get sick. Um, and what people don't know is that pretty much all grains contain um, self-defense mechanisms to prevent them from being digested. Because once they're digested, they're no, they can no longer reproduce. Um, so grains contain self-defense mechanisms. Um, and beans are a perfect example. Uh, when you eat a bean, it doesn't want to be digested, so it produces a gas. Um, all grains have these qualities and how, it's, how it, you treat them with niche tumulization. Uh, it has a lot of different names, but um, it, uh, Asians use gypsum, uh, Mexicans use uh, volcanic ash, and American Indians, we use uh, softwood ash, um, all for the same purpose. Um, and once you learn how to, to convert um, and release the nutrients in grains, um, then you start compounding uh, how to ferment a, a plant because not all of it ferments the same way. Leaves don't ferment the same way as stalks and roots. So there's multiple uh, methods to it, but it's just basic uh, distillation. Um, and so essentially what we're learning how to do is uh, hunt specific nutrients and break them down, render them water soluble and how to administer them. Um, and we do so in a, a balanced manner. Um, and so what's funny is once we start looking at uh, what we're feeding and how we're feeding it, you start to realize these are our traditional foods and we're supposed to be eating these. We're supposed to be eating like this. Um, and so, so yeah, that's kind of my little, my little bit on, you know, feeding cannabis like an Indian child and, and upwards. Um, that's it. Thank you. That's a really great diet. <laughs> I like it. Um, and so we, we do these and I've been trying to uh, promote this, you know, to Indian groups out there. Um, I, I, I feel confident that uh, if there's any groups out there that are growing, maybe struggling, I feel I could offer um, consultation to help improve things. Um, I'm looking to get involved with uh, groups out there that are growing uh, any way possible. Thank you. We'll be sure to come back to you when we start our grow school. Uh. Yeah, for sure. So, um, unfortunately, it's super interesting conversation, and we've scratched the surface yet again of, of many very interesting things, but I think we have to draw the evening to a close. It's 7.43, um, but I thank everyone for their time, and I thank uh, all of you for attending and for viewing and for submitting the questions, and I know that some people have asked for extra information. Um, on the topics that Travis and Saron were presenting and we will um, do our best to get those to you and get them posted on our website and in our newsletter. If you're not signed up with our newsletter, please do so. And uh, please consider contributing to New York Small Pharma or to Sharon's organization or um, to Travis's work. Um, and then please also reach out to them uh, as, as well. So we thank everyone for attending and for being here. And we definitely thank our panelists for their insights this evening. For all of us at New York Small Pharma and on this panel, we wish everyone a good night.